All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Robertson, one of the pastors here at Huntington Beach Church. And again, we just want to welcome all of you here. We welcome all of our guests here that are with us today. We welcome all those who are now going to be tuning in online as we start our live stream this morning. And uh, we always want to be able to minister to those of our, in our congregation that cannot make it uh, on this particular Sunday, as well as those that are watching us all across the world. So we welcome everyone uh, into our worship service this morning. And uh, so we have a special, a special Sunday uh, message prepared for you today. And I want to say a few words before I introduce our speaker, because I do know that there's some of you here that are very new to Christianity and very new to Huntington Beach Church. And uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about ourselves because as you're coming here and God's bringing you to this church, you're finding out what God has in store for you and your purpose in life. And so our church, as you see here on the screen behind me, is a church planting church. Uh, when we uh, came here back in 2016 and this congregation and I met together, uh, the Lord put it on our heart to begin to give this property away, to give away everything we've got to reach this community uh, with the gospel. Amen? And so you see here on the screen behind you, we began to multiply. We have a Hispanic congregation, we have a Korean congregation, we have uh, the Garage Church, which is represented this morning. Good to see some of the Garage Church here today. We have a Daily Church. You see this screen that has the little gray circles. Uh, we're expanding. This year, uh, there's probably a dozen or more churches that we are uh, uh, involved in and helping them plant. And we have partnered up with others to help us in this endeavor. And so that's what we're all about. The good news is this means there is opportunity every single day in this church for us to do ministry. Amen? <clears throat> every single day. In fact, yesterday was one of the most incredible days. How many of you were here yesterday for our uh, big event? Good. Man, wasn't that awesome? About 250 uh, guests that were with us from the community and uh, we just had a great time. We also got to introduce our new preschool to the community. And so uh, we did get some sign-ups. People have been asking. But we not only got people interested, we got people that paid their tuition and uh, signed up to come. So praise God for that. Amen. And uh, we have uh, the Recovery Center. Some of you are, uh, know the Recovery Center very well, go to it every single day. And uh, they tell me there's some 900 people a week that come here on the campus to our recovery center. And it's just, what I'm telling you is, there's a story here that God is doing. And because you're here, you're part of that story. No matter where you're from, no matter your background, no matter what's gone on in the past, God's about to change everything. You're, you've got a whole new future ahead of you. And, and there, are, there is many opportunities right here on this camp campus for you to get involved. We're here to help you, to train you. And, uh, but we want to send you out into this world to make a difference in the name of the Lord. Amen? So that's what it's all about. Now, that leads me into saying something else. By the way, if you could put the little QR code up there, JJ, uh, we're, uh, if you'd like our members, if you'd like to give as we give each week, uh, you can go to that QR code. You can find the online giving. And when you go to online giving, there's actually a special uh, offering that you can give to this week called the Annie Armstrong Offering which is uh, an offering that we give to that goes to our national convention, and it helps other churches like us to plant. It goes to church plants all over America. And so every, every year around Easter, we give extra above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings to the Annie Armstrong offering. And so you'll find all that on that QR code if you take a look. And uh, if not, we can help you after service to find all of that as well. But speaking of our partners... That's what brings me to our guest speaker today, because I, I want to say a few things. We, uh, we are a Southern Baptist church, and for many of you, that, that you've never been a part of a Southern Baptist church, and you're still learning what that's all about. And here's the main thing you need to know. We are Southern Baptists because the Southern Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist churches, have figured out the secret to success in getting the gospel out around the world, and that's cooperation. In other words, we're not just about ourselves. You can see that with the way we're multiplying. We're not just about ourselves. We are about the kingdom of God. 
And we believe the best way to get the gospel out to the entire world is not to be self-focused and inwardly focused, but to partner with others, to help one another, to partner with like-minded churches all around the world, and together we can do more than we can do alone. And so, that's really the secret to our success. That's why the Southern Baptists, our movement is the largest Protestant movement that there is, and it's simply because we got the right attitude and the right spirit. Now, that all Southern Baptist churches can be a little different. If you've been to one and then go to another one, it could be completely different. But what we got in common is our belief in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we make that the main thing, and that's what we partner together in all of our efforts to uh, get out to the world. Now, one of the ways we partner is we, for example, we're partnering here locally on our campus with all of these church plants that we're planting. That's one way we partner. We also partner with all of our Southern Baptist churches in our county, Orange County. And we have an office set up called the Orange County Southern Baptist Association. And I work on their staff with them. And, and what we're doing is partnering with all of our sister churches in this county uh, to get the gospel out and plant more churches. But we also partner with all Southern Baptist churches in the state of California. And we have an office that keeps all of that organized, and that's called the California Southern Baptist Convention, the CSBC. And uh, that's located up in Fresno. And that, that office set up up there is designed to keep, keep uh, everything we're doing, all of our efforts, organized. And it's designed as well to uh, allow us to kind of put our funds together, to focus on special needs. Again, we can do much more working together than we can do independently, right? And so that office is designed to keep all of that organized, and we partner with them, and, they, and, and through that we partner with every church, every Southern Baptist church in our state. And so that's called the CSBC, the California Southern Baptist Convention. Well, this morning, the executive director of the CSBC, the executive, the guy who runs the whole thing, and keeps it all organized, the man who casts a vision for our state and says, here's what we can do together to make a difference in the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, he's making a difference. God, we believe that right now God is doing, I, I think, the, the largest uh, kingdom growth movement in the state of California in the history of this state. And so, God has raised up the right men and women to put in positions to help us keep all of this organized. And uh, none is more important than our executive director. And his name is Pete Ramirez. He was a pastor here in our state. And now, God, he's still, he's still a member of his church and uh, works with his church. But he now uh, gives his efforts to helping organize this kingdom movement in the state of California. And so this morning... Here at Huntington Beach Church, we have the great privilege and honor of hearing from our state director. Let's give a warm welcome to Pete Ramirez. All right. He told me I have an hour to speak. Is that right? No, it's not right. I'm going to move this iPad because I might take it home if I leave it up here. It is so good to be with you guys this morning. I've had allergies. If you guys know anything about Fresno, is that it's the allergy capital of the world. Everybody that lives there gets like this, this, these uh, sinus fevers and all this other stuff and junk, and it's just horrible. But, but I'm fine. I'm feeling great. You know, other than that, I went to the Dodger game last night, and I'm a Dodger fan. Sorry, Angel fans. And, and uh, we won really good. It was like 10 to 1, three home runs by Trace Thompson. It was pretty cool. I grew up here in the LA area, not in Orange County, but uh, I pastored in La Habra, if you guys know where that's at, and, and so this is home, Southern California is home for me. But I'm, I'm excited, I mean, pastors did such an awesome job of talking about who we are as Southern Baptists, right? But do you know that in California we have over 2,300 Southern Baptist churches in California, 2,300. Now, we can't find about 800 of them because they've kind of fallen off the radar, but the other ones are pretty active. They're pretty active giving, attending, uh, sending reports, 
working together like, like, like your church does. And last year, while we were working with these churches, we gave our churches over 400 uh, different kind of grants and scholarships for them to do outreach events. And every one of the churches that we helped for them to do an outreach event, I want you to hear this number. They, on the reports that they sent back to us, they reported back that the gospel was presented to 90,000 people during those events last year. That's what we do together, right? That wasn't one church. That wasn't like Harvest Festival down in Anaheim, okay? No, that was all the smaller churches, right? Not the mega churches like, like Saddleback. They do their own thing. You know, those churches, they do. But it's the smaller churches. And a lot of times we think churches can't do a lot. But when we all come together, 90,000 people heard the gospel. That's pretty cool. Just through those events. There are other things that are being done. Like a church had a vision out here in Norwalk some years ago. And they created something called the, the SoCal Ministries. And SoCal Ministries was a vision of a, of a church that was dying. They had a building. They sold the building for $20 million. They put the money in an endowment, and they used our California Foundation okay, to put the money in there, and they created a, a, a committee. And this committee every year gives funds for churches that want to do outreach events, and they want to do uh, mission trips. And they pour, they've poured out over the last 10 years more than $7 million, folks back into the ministry, into the churches. Again, this was because somebody decided, hey, you know what? We are a collective of churches. We can work better together. What if we create a means through a foundation that people can give money to so that we can put money back into ministry? That is what's happening among Southern Baptists here in California that provides means and resources for churches. The last couple of years, we've been supporting 55 churches with monthly checks and support to help church plants through the state convention. That doesn't even count what our national agency is doing. When you count both of us together, that's over 200 churches that are currently uh, being sponsored right now financially, month in, month out. And not only that, they don't only get money, but they get support. They get taken to, to, uh, to retreats like the Send Network that I was just at in San Diego and another retreat that they had here at the Weston in Anaheim, the Refresh retreat that are there to minister to pastors and their wives. How important is our pastor and, and, and the wives, right? They are the, the tip of the spear of the church. If the pastor's not healthy, if the wife is not healthy, then the church is not going to be healthy. And so we're being intentional as a state convention, as a national convention, to make sure that our pastors and our wives are healthy. Coming out of COVID, everybody was just struggling, having a really hard time. And as a state convention, we're, we're, we're really trying to minister to them so that they can minister to the church. Just last month, we were at Gateway Seminary, which is our Southern Baptist Seminary in the West, which I think is the best one. That's just me because I, I graduated from there. But that seminary, we had what we had Missions College. And Missions College was a, a, a time where missionaries came off the field. They came from East Asia, Pacific Rim countries, and... and, and uh, and from the Americas, and they came and they trained our people to talk about how to go about on a mission trip, how to sign up to become a missionary and go to the international mission field. Again, this is something we do together as churches. In our state convention, uh, we, we led that movement to, to bring that missions college to California. They had never done that missions college west of the Mississippi. So they don't even know what tacos are, right? They had done this always in, in Virginia, right? out there in Richmond and out on that side of the country. But this year was the first year. We're expecting 100 missionaries to go out of California because of that training that occurred. I pray that your church would be a church that would send people to the mission field. Folks, it's so important for us to not just think of California, but for us to think of the world. And as a Southern Baptist churches, as we're working together, folks, we can do a lot. We can do a lot. We, we live in a state that, as I look into the, in, in this room, I see different ethnicities, uh, I, I, and I love it, because that's the way that the, 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 the Church of Christ needs to be. And when we think of 2,300 Southern Baptist churches in California, you got to think that about 400 of them primarily minister to African American people. Over, five, over 400, close to 500, minister to people that are 
nice and like brown like I am, you know, Hispanic churches, you know, like the one you got over here in the back. Yeah, there, there's that many Hispanics in, in the state of California. We got, we got churches, we got about, uh, about Chinese and Korean, we're, we're close to about 500 churches and that, and then the rest are just, are, are just a diversity, a mix of them. 76 different languages on Sunday morning are being preached through Southern Baptist churches in California. That's just in California. Um, that's who you are part of. When your church gives to the cooperative program, when your church gives to Annie Armstrong offering, to Lottie Moon, when you give to the California Missions offering, when you give to your, your association, everything you give, folks, you become a part of, that, of, of what's happening, not just here in California, not just in the nation, but in the world. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Continue to do it. I know that it's that sometimes we think, well, we want to keep a little bit more here, you know, give Pastor a little bit more, right? So he can maybe go get a, his, his beard shaven off or something, you know, just for fun. But, you know, but give it to missions. Give it to missions. Um, every church that I pastored, I, I was sure that our church would be increasing its missions giving, its mission uh, praying for missions, its mission going. And uh, I just saw God bless our church. God bless our church continually. And, uh, and I believe that that's what happens. That what we plant, as we're doing the work of the kingdom of God, then we receive later from the Lord. And I'm not talking about, you know, you're going to get rich on something. No. I'm talking about you be rich in, in just abundance of joy because you're serving the Lord. And God will show you great things as you are about doing the great commission the kingdom work that God has called us to do. Amen? Amen. There's a lot more. I, I, can, I can go on and keep talking about, like, last, last month we had uh, uh, 700 students up in the Bay Area, high school students that, that attended our, our event. We're doing another event down here in November, and, and we're expecting 1,000 students at that event. We're talking about close to 2,000 students that will come together and worship the Lord and make professions of faith and make commitments to, to serve the Lord. That's the kind of stuff that's happening that's not been happening in the past. Um, our, our, our battle cry in California is that we're better together. As we serve together as churches, as state convention partners and agencies, as we do the work that the Lord has called us to do, with the primary focus as, as, as agencies is to come alongside our churches and to resource the vision of the churches. And I tell my staff all this all the time. We have a staff of about 28. I tell the staff, guys, we don't have to come up with anything new. What we need to do is take the resources that we have as if it's fuel and just put it over the fire of wherever the Holy Spirit is moving in the state of California and where he's calling us to and add fuel to that fire. And God is doing that. And I'm thankful for your pastor and the willingness that he has always to, to serve in different areas with different partners, because folks, that's when we're better, when we work all together. Anyway, let me get into the Word of God this morning, okay? Because I can just keep talking all day and be excited about what is happening in the state of California. But go with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. And, and how much time do I have? An hour. An hour. How I'm, I'm going to go about 25 minutes, maybe 30, okay? I'm going to try to go fast, so you have to listen fast. Can you listen fast? Acts chapter 13. This is one of my favorite passages because this church right here, the church of Antioch that it's being referred to, is a church that is a missional church, is a church that I believe is a model for churches today, is a model of a church that was not a mega church, okay? This church of Antioch, probably was about this size right here. It never grew to be one of those mega churches of 1,000 people or even a mega church of, you know, of, uh, of 500. We think that it was between somewhere between 100 to 200 people, okay? We hear of the church of Antioch beginning in chapter 11, okay? This church began because of the persecution that, be, that, that, that was occurring in Jerusalem with the Jews, and as they started expanding out, they, they headed out to Antioch, these people that were being persecuted, and they started reaching people of different ethnicities, of different languages, and we find this church here, this church of Antioch in chapter 13, looking out into the mission field, understanding that it's not just about this church, 
but it's, a lot, it's about a lot, a lot more. So I think that this church is, is really kind of like you guys, okay? So it's going to be a reminder this morning of how you need to continue to be from what I already know about what you already do, amen? So this is what the Word of God says, and I'm going to invite you to stand as I read the first uh, five verses, and, and we're just going to stick to these five verses this morning, and we're going to ask the Lord to minister to us this morning through them as I speak, and that he may use this mouth to share his word. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It says, In the local church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Menem, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they were ministering to the Lord and fasting to the Holy Spirit. Fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed God's message in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word that we would see, Father, that there are things that as a church that we must remember, that we must, Father, learn from. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move, Father, in this place and that it would open up, Father, the eyes to understand, Father, the work that is around us and the work that you're calling, Father, your church to do. Father, speak through this mouth your words and not my own. For your glory, Father, for it's yours alone. And we ask these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we see some healthy marks of this missionary church. The first thing that we see in this church of Antioch is that it tells us that it had prophets and it had teachers. This, this is a healthy thing for a church, for it to have spiritual leaders. The prophets were those that had, these, these prophets here are not prophets like in the Old Testament that they would speak on God's behalf, new revelation, but these prophets here are more like pastors. They're, 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 they're men that are leading the congregation according to the word of God. And that's why it aligns them with these prophets like, like, and teachers, right? In, in the beginning, as we, at the beginning of the church, we also had the, the apostles, right? These were all men that were, again, from the same line, bringing the revelation of the word of God to God's people. And so what we see here is that they had the right kind of leaders. Today we don't have prophets, we have pastors, we have preachers. We still have teachers, right? Uh, we, we have evangelists, we have, we have people that come and share the word, but, but it's so important that every church have the right kind of leaders. We also have churches that have elders. Do you guys have elders here? Do you guys have elders? Elders are, 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 are biblical, right? These are the kind of leaders every church needs to have. Men that have been, that, that, that have been called, that have been gifted, that have the responsibility to lead in the congregation. Now, teachers could be males, they could be females, they, they, they could be children, even children teach, right? Uh, but, there, there's, but these teachers are people that, are, that, that have gifts, that understand how to teach the Word of God, that understand how, 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 what the Word of God means and how it, how it comes together as a whole. Men and women that have gifts. But here in this church, we see that there were, there were prophets, there were those preachers, there were those leaders, and there were teachers. And it tells us that, these, that some of the people that were in this church, it gives us a, a reference to five of them. The first one that we see here is Barnabas. Barnabas, as, as we know, he, his name meant the encourager. He was a, a Levite Jew from Cyprus. Uh, that's what we find in the scripture. So he, he was different than Simeon. Simeon, uh, who, who's, who tells us here that he is called Niger, which probably tells us that he's from somewhere from, from Africa. And because of the description that we're given of him probably is, is black. So we see that Barnabas and, and Simeon are, are very different in who, even how they look, not just where they're from. 
Then we see Lucius of Cyrene, and that would mean that he would have been from North Africa. And now that doesn't necessarily mean that he would have been dark. It's just that's where he's from. He's from a different place than the other two. And we see Manaim, this man that, that was a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, uh, that probably grew up somewhere among the Romans and, and was, it, it was trained in a very diff- different way. And, and he is understood to be a step brother to, 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 to that family. Um, and so we, then finally we see Saul, Saul of Tarsus, and we know about, about Saul, right? And uh, this, I mean, it, it, that became Paul. And, and we know all the work that, that he gets to do. So we see the, the, this, this man saw the, the Pharisee of Pharisees and the Jew of Jews and, you know, and it just this, this guy that was vibrant. And this is a pretty cool group, okay? Just with, just with Barnabas and, and with Saul, we, if you know anything about what's going to happen in the chapters ahead, these, these guys were like a missionary force, kind of like the missionary force that the Southern Baptist Convention is today. I mean, we don't get to write books in the Bible like Saul did, but but we get to see churches started and people getting saved. And, and really, this is the beginning of it. But they were in one church together. Wouldn't it have been great for that church just to keep everybody? Well, that's not what happens, right? But this is where they're at. This church that is multi, uh, multi-ethnic, that is diverse in, in the people. And really, that's what every church should be. Every church should be this way. Unless you live somewhere where everybody looks like you, your church should not look like just you. Your church should look like its community. And sometimes your church, when it looks like your community, it means you have a Spanish language going on over there and a Korean language happening in the afternoon like you do here. But it's still the church. The church in Antioch. The church here in Huntington Beach really should look very different. The people coming into the parking lot and into the buildings should look like its community. That's what was happening in Antioch. Those are the kind of people that were there. So not only do they have the right kind of teachers, but they have the right kind of people and the right kind of mix. And what, what were they doing? It tells us there in verse 2 that, that they, they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. They were ministering to the Lord and fasting. They were ministering unto the Lord, really. And folks, that's what happens and sh- or should be happening always in the church. The church, folks, is not created so that you come to church, feel good, and then go home and say, I, I, I've, I've fulfilled my task. No. The church has been created By God, for God, that's what we're all here for. We're here to worship God. If you came to be entertained today, you came to the wrong place. We came here today to minister unto the Lord. Now, when we minister unto the Lord, we do it in different ways. We sing, we hear his word, we become obedient to his word, we might work in the nursery, we might change even a diaper. Thank God I don't have to do that anymore, right? But ministering unto the Lord looks different depending on the gift that God has given you. But these people had it right. They were ministering unto the Lord. Not ministering unto each other. We serve one another. We minister unto the Lord. Every healthy missionary church will have these things in their church. And it must be healthy first in the the church, in the local church, if we're going to be a powerful mission force in our state, in our city, in the nation, and, or in the world. It has to begin here. I thank the Lord because I see a lot of that here. I, can, I just want to encourage you, continue. Continue to do that. But then we also see another thing in this church. It says that as they were ministering to the Lord in verse 2, and they were ministering to the Lord and they were fasting, it said that the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit said. And I'll just stop there. How did they hear the Holy Spirit? Was it from the voice in the sky? 
Was it a tablet? I just finished watching the Ten Commandments last night. It was on ABC, right? Anybody watch it? You know, I was like, thou shalt not commit adultery. And, you know, and they just wrote it on these tablets, right? And then he goes up and grabs the tablets and, and just hugs them, you know? Was it like that? That the Lord spoke? And, no, we, we don't know. It's very vague how the Holy Spirit spoke. But they were obviously hearing, because if it says in the Bible that the Holy Spirit spoke, they were obviously hearing, and the Lord made it real to them. The Lord made it obvious to them. How did the Holy Spirit speak? I don't know. But I'll tell you how he speaks today. Right here. Oh, there goes my Bible. There goes my, my, my stuff. I'm sorry. I'm throwing, you can leave that one there. I'll pick it up after. This is it. This is how he speaks. He also speaks in the affirmation of others. There was a guy at my church one year. He, he, he'd come and go from the church. He'd disappear every once in a while. Uh, he'd come back and, and he says to me, Pastor, I feel like God is asking me to teach. I heard your sermon this Sunday. I'm convicted. I feel like I need to be teaching a class. Can you... Can you give me a class to teach? And I'm like, well, um, I know he had just gone through a divorce. He'd just gone through some really crazy stuff. He'd been out in the world drinking. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not sure this guy's going to be the guy to be teaching the class right now in our church. So I'm going to put him to the test, right? All this stuff was going through my head. And I said, hey, brother, you know that, that piece of grass over there in the back? You know, we, we didn't get to it during cleaning day on, on Saturday. Could you come out here? I know you got some time. Can you come out here and clean it out for us? And the guy uh, said, sure, pastor. Kind of put his head down. He walked out of my office and disappeared for months. Well, he comes back to the church, like, you know, a few months later, and he says, pastor, can I talk to you one day? And I said, sure, anytime. He comes into my office one day, shows up. He says, pastor, I'm mad at you. He says, I had asked you to give me an opportunity to serve in the church. And you ignored me. And I thought, huh. He said, brother, do you remember that grass that I told you about in the back of the church? And oh, he just put his head down. You know, it was pretty obvious to me as a leader that God has not called this guy to be a teacher. Not at that point. As spiritual leaders, we see, we can, we can look into other people's lives and, and see, man, this guy's called to be a pastor. How do I know? Well, he, he knows the word of God. He can discern the word of God. He knows how to teach the word of God. I, I can tell that this person is called to, to work with youth. How, how do I know? Well, the youth kind of follow him, and he, he's got a good testimony. I can tell that this, this lady here, she, she's got a gifting to be able to lead women's ministry. How do I know? Well, Look at how the women rally around her and when they're asking for advice from her and, and, and you see the gifts and you see the, the, there's, there's a, a walk that is right with the Lord and these men had a, had a walk that was right with the Lord. There was a, there was, there was a commitment to, to the Lord and then there was a gifting and the Lord said, the Lord said. And so we hear, we see things that are consistent with his word. It's not like all of a sudden I, got, I ate bad pizza and, you know, oh, the Lord is telling me. Yeah, the Lord's telling you to go to the restroom. <laughs> you know, don't be calling any numbers and asking somebody to give you some information. It's not like, you know, psychic line or nothing like that. No, the Lord speaks consistent to his will. Consistent to his will. This was a spiritual hearing church. And it says that as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. And after that they heard that they were supposed to set apart these two men to be sent out, it says after they had done this, they fasted and prayed. How many of you guys like to fast? Yeah, only a few of us, right? I like to eat. I hate fasting. I'm all about tacos, carnitas, hamburgers, smoked meat, you know, tri-tip, brisket, all that stuff that you want to go eat now, right? 
That's, that's what I'm all about. I mean, I got my Traeger at home. I, I try to use that thing as much as I can. Put a nice one pound, you know, ribeye in there for about an hour, let it smoke, and then do the reverse sear. You know what I'm talking about? And on a good day, I put a tomahawk and just, you know, stick the three pounds in there, right? Maybe share some with my wife. What, what, what am I talking about? Yeah, I know. I'm joking. I'm just letting it soak in, letting it soak. I don't, I don't like to fast. I like to eat. But if I want to look skinny, I have to fast every once in a while. That's the only way it's going to happen. It takes discipline. And there are spiritual disciplines that we must have as a church. This church demonstrated it had these disciplines. Not only did they hear from God, but after they heard from God, then it says that then they fasted and they prayed. What were they doing? They were asking, Lord, reaffirm to us that these are the men we're supposed to send out. Reaffirm to us, Lord. Now, now that you've told us, Lord, now show us. And, and they discipline themselves from removing something out of their lives because, you see, let me tell you a secret. Fasting doesn't always have to be food. You can fast from Facebook, Instagram. You can, you, 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 you can fast from from watching TV. It's whatever it takes your time to give your time to the Lord. To give more attention and time to your spiritual walk with Him. To be in, to in, in, in tune with, with His voice. That's what they were doing. That's what every church needs to do. I love it when churches hold prayer meetings. Not time to preach, not just time to sing, because a lot of times those prayer meetings, that's all they become is preaching and, 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 and singing, but just prayer time. That's what they did. And then they did something that's really cool. Verse 3, look at what it says, the second part. It says, they laid hands on them and not around their necks, and then they sent them off. That, that tells me that this church was a people-sending church. I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't grow to be a mega church. Because imagine if you had Paul preaching every Sunday. Man, that's pretty good. You can probably grow a, a, a saddleback, right? But this was a people-sending church. They sent their very best. The encourager Barnabas. And Paul, the fiery preacher that would tell it like it is, that could start churches all over the place. They sacrificed, sending their very best. A lot of churches nowadays, when they, when they want to multiply, it's called a split. And they send the deacon and the ten guys that like him to another place, and they say, we, we multiplied. We sent them off. Folks, that's not the way it's supposed to work. This is the way it's supposed to work. You lay hands on them. You pray the Lord's blessing over them. You pray for the Lord's protection over them. You pray for the Lord's grace to be over them in the ministry that they're about to do. And you, you pray a blessing over them and you send them out, understanding that you've got a responsibility to be praying for them and continue to pray for them. And maybe even continue to support them financially. They commissioned them off their very best. I, I don't like to, to fish and release. I don't like it. It's not in my nature. I want to fish it, catch it, gut it, fry it, eat it. That's selfish of me, especially when a lake needs to be uh, matured and allow fish to grow. Folks, we cannot be selfish as a church. We must think of what is out there. We must think of the lost world around us. 
and be willing to send our very best out so that the world that's out there lacking preachers and lacking uh, men and women that are gifted to do the work of the kingdom can do the work in other places. When's the last time your church sent out a missionary? I know you guys have done church plants, but when's the last time you guys sent out a, a missionary? You know that I'm your missionary? I'm your missionary. You didn't send me out. The church of San Jose sent me out. Because that's where I was pastoring before I became a missionary. I'm, I'm your missionary in California. But when's the last time we sent out a missionary as a church? You. You should be looking and praying, fasting, asking the Lord who's going to go out. And I know some of you guys are ready to ship your wife somewhere, but <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> you might be the one shipped out, brother. They were sending them out, being sent out by the Holy Spirit. You see, this is God's plan. God's plan was to send Jesus to die on the cross for this church to be started, for the Holy Spirit to be guiding the church and empowering the church to do the work, the missional work that we're called to do, the kingdom work, the great commission work that we're still called to do today, which is not just feeding people, which we do. It's not just about showing people good hygiene, which we do. It's not just about showing people how to get off of drugs, which we do. It's not just about doing good works. It's about proclaiming God's message. It says that they went out, right? And they came down to Seleucia in verse 4. And from there they sailed to Cyprus and they arrived to Salamis. They went to these different places. And then it says... They proclaim God's message in the Jewish synagogues. Why there? Well, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. Why not go to people that are expecting uh, this, this Messiah to come? Why not go to people that perhaps would listen to this, the, 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 the gospel message? Go to those people. A missional church is going to be intentional about who it's going to try to reach. It's not just going to go to anybody. It's going to go to people that perhaps might have some curiosity. Perhaps God might be working in their lives somehow. And they go out to them and they proclaim the gospel message. The good news. The great love of Jesus. The deep love of Jesus. The vastness of his grace. That even though they don't deserve to be forgiven for their sin, in his grace, Christ came and died for their sins, to forgive them of their sin. That they can't save themselves on their own. People don't understand grace. They don't understand the gospel message. Religion is all about what? People trying to save themselves. But what we believe is not about a relation, religion, but a relationship with God. That when we surrender our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, when we come to him and we say, I can't save myself, only you can save me, Lord. Forgive me for my sins. Come and be the Lord of my life. That at that moment that we bow down our knee to him, that we surrender and we confess who he is when we believe that he is the only one that can save us, not us and our works, not us and, and other gods or saints or anything else except for Jesus, that we are saved alone because of our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did, that he died and was resurrected on the third day, being the perfect and complete satisfaction of the wrath of God that he died in our place and we are forgiven because of his free gift of grace. Hallelujah. That is what we preach. That is what we proclaim. That is what the church needs to continue to be about. That's why we sang that song. Because we could have sang something from Bruno Mars and that would have been more fun perhaps for some of you. That's not what we sing. 
We're not here to be entertained. We're a missional church. We're here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. As a church, I want to encourage you. Continue to do what God has called you to do. We have a great work to do in California. There's a great work to do in Huntington Beach. And it's not just surfing. Because I wouldn't know how to do that. There's a great work to do in the nation. The nation is lost. This nation, folks, I mean, I'm born here. My kids are born here. My grandson is born here. I love this country, but we're messed up. And the only hope is the gospel. And the church has the answer. This world is in a bad place. And it's only going to get worse. But we have hope. We have the hope for this world. And that is in Jesus. We need to be a missional church. Church, I want to encourage you. Don't forget the mission. Follow the example of this church. Let's be faithful to our Lord. May God bless you. Pastor, will you come close?